Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels from Sandusky, Ohio, and I'm glad that you're listening. I have to tell you, it's great to say episode 10 being in double digits. They tell podcasters starting out, you've got to get past episode 7 and then episode 9. Well, I've made it to episode 10 now, and I'm thrilled to be here. For those of you who've listened to the first few episodes, I want to thank you for coming back again. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, I'm thrilled that you've decided to take a listen. I can only imagine how busy you are, and I truly appreciate you taking time to tune into my show. Don't forget that while you can find this podcast at a yankonthefooty.podbean.com, you can also find it on your favorite podcast provider. After you've listened, I would love if you'd consider giving me a review. It lets me know what I need to work on and what I'm doing well. I would also appreciate it if you'd consider sharing a link to the show with your friends, whether they're fans of footy or not. Don't forget, you can also reach me at a yank on the footy at gmail.com as well as on Twitter at yank underscore on and on Facebook and Instagram at a yank on the footy. As I move into this episode, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of other great American footy podcasts that are out there and are definitely worth a listen. The first one I want to mention is one that's called Outside 50, and it's hosted by Rick Shibani and Wayne Kraska. And Wayne, I believe, is in the Atlanta area, and Rick, I believe, lives in Los Angeles now. He spent a few years in Australia and is back in the States. And I've not met Wayne. I've not spoken to him. I've traded messages with him online. But from what I have gathered, Wayne is an absolute icon in the American footy world. And Rick's back in the States after having spent a couple years in Australia playing footy, working in his profession there as well. The focus of their podcast is, much of it is, on the U.S. AFL. So if you're wanting to keep up with what's happening here in the States... These two gentlemen are somebody you should definitely take a listen to. I've listened to a couple of episodes, and they are extraordinarily knowledgeable and very entertaining. And I'm hoping to have both of these gentlemen on my show in the very near future. The other podcast that I wanted to mention today that I would strongly encourage you to take a listen to is one called AFL Obsessed. And it's hosted by a New Yorker, and boy does she know her stuff. She's only a handful of episodes into her journey, but it sure sounds like a well-polished program. As I'm typing this, Rosanna, who is the host, is tweeting from Perth. I promise I'm not going to be envious. I'm not going to be envious. I've seen the movie Seven. I know how that goes, for goodness sake. I will not be envious. I hope you're having a great time, Rosanna. In reality, I've listened to both of these shows, as I said, and they bring a great deal to the table with regards to learning more and more about this game. Now, as I dive into the subject matter for this week's episode, I wanted to touch on a couple of things from the outset. First off, as I was working on writing this script, and I finished it up just a little while ago, it was 1 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, here in the state of Ohio, and I was waiting for the Cats and Sons contest to get started in the Marsh series. I posted on uh, social media earlier that day uh, an image um, about me getting ready to sit down and watch that first preseason contest, and it was going to be an awful lot like that iconic opening line from that Garth Brooks song, you know, well, with the time difference. 3.30 in the morning... Not a soul in sight. City's looking like a ghost town. Well, you get the idea. I'm not going to sing here. That's not why I'm here. But uh, it most certainly was like that. Um, I have to be honest, though. Full disclosure, I actually like the uh, cover version that the band All That Remains did of that song, The Thunder Rolls. It's really good. Um, Now that I'm recording, it's after the game has been played. And Gold Coast, you played one terrific game. And I surely hope that my beloved cats were pacing themselves and you know, had several players getting ready to participate in the State of Origin games, State of Origin game coming up here very soon. So it was kind of an ugly performance for the cats, but again, it's the preseason. 
they don't count. Now, the State of Origin game looks like it's going to be something that's going to be a fantastic event. It's great to see the league bringing the best of the best together for such a worthy cause. And I think playing it right after the, the D's and Pies game is another great idea, as the anticipation of the State of Origin game can only help with providing a great deal of additional positive exposure to the women's game. And I wonder if there's any consideration, and maybe you know this, and let me know. Send me a tweet. Send me an email. Let me know. I wonder if there's any consideration to hold the State of Origin game. I think I might have said State of the Union game earlier. I teach government in high school, and we watched the State of the Union address earlier. So if I said State of the Union, I'm sorry about that. The State of the Origin game. I wonder if there's talk about doing this every year and possibly extending the women's season maybe by a week, and have the women's clubs play a state of origin game at the same time. Kind of a double header, similar to what they're doing now, instead of having it with the uh, the D's and Pies game, having the women's state of origin game along with the men's. I'd be surprised if that isn't at least being bandied about at the AFL headquarters that they haven't talked about it. I don't think it hurts anything to extend the women's season one more week. Give them an opportunity to have an all-star game, if you will. You know, like I said, these all-star games, they can be great money makers for the charities that the AFL wants to contribute to. And of course, you know, what they're doing right now, I can't think of anything better than raising money for the uh, Bush fire relief efforts. Uh, I think it's fantastic that the players are looking to do this sort of thing. And this is one of the things that, the major sports in the U.S. tend to do rather well. The baseball all-star game, which is in the middle of the season, is extraordinarily popular. Okay, They have the home run derby, where you've got somebody throwing batting practice to the, some of the best hitters in the game to see how many balls they can hit out of the stadium with you know making a certain number of outs. Um, they have a celebrity, I think a softball game. They also have a, a, a futures game where they bring in some of the best young players that are playing the game who haven't made it to the major leagues yet. They haven't made it to the pinnacle, but it's like these are the kids who are on the cusp of being the best. So the Major League Baseball has it down. The NBA, who we're going to be talking about quite a bit later on in this episode, has turned All-Star Weekend into a massive event. Celebrities from all over the country and probably all over the world showing up to watch the festivities. They have the slam dunk contest where people try to come up with the most creative slam dunks, the three point shooting contest. They have a celebrity game and then the game itself, which tends to be one of the more high scoring affairs of the season. I know the AFL has done different specialty rounds as the AFLW is doing this weekend as I'm recording this uh, and pertain to different issues, but having this kind of an all-star contest coupled with the AFLW, I think, would be a great opportunity for fans to see the greatest the game has to offer on on the same field at the same time. Now, I'm not talking about having the men and women play on the field at the same time. That's not what I'm saying. But I think it would be a great opportunity for the fans to see the best of the best all in one place at one time. If I could make one recommendation, though, just my two cents worth, I don't think they should invite Meatloaf to perform during that weekend. Just my two cents worth. Okay. I know Meatloaf's a touchy subject. Now, not sure how many of you got a chance to watch some games in round two of the AFLW. Round three is going on as I'm writing this and recording this. But uh, I've got to tell you, that matchup last week between Collingwood and Carlton, wow. Wow. I think if you watch that one, you've got to concur that those young ladies that were playing in that game, they realize what kind of rivalry that game is. There was some serious hitting going on in that game. I wish some of the teams in the NFL were able to hit like that. It was it was amazing because they were getting after one another. Now, there was nothing malicious. It was good, hard tackling that was happening. It was a... Very well-played game, I thought. And I have to tell you, I think it was wonderful to see Sharni Layton 
play such a dynamic game as well. And that's really two games in a row for her. I haven't watched Collingwood's game this weekend, so I don't know how things went. But she is seemingly was everywhere on the oval. She was all over the place, and her ball skills have improved dramatically, especially when she's the ball's down below her knees, something that she maybe struggled with a little bit last year. But it's, she's become much more of a natural at that and is really picking up the game very well. And it, it's fantastic to watch that. And uh, I think she could be a huge addition and big help to the Magpies going forward this year through the rest of their their fixture. Now, I, of course, I'm saying that, like I said, I hadn't watched the whole game, and I just tipped, turned the TV on and watched uh, Sharni take a great mark and kick a goal in the first quarter in, in the game with the Dockers, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I did see that the Pies did not win this weekend. Now, one of the other things that I was able to watch this week was the uh, the game at Marvel Stadium between the uh, Kangaroos and the Bulldogs. Now, I'm not sure how the rest of the March Community Series is going to play out, but I have to tell you, in my personal opinion, the best thing that I think any of us will see was the return of Magic Daw. As we know, 2019 was a very difficult year for that young man, and he went through some very trying times seeing him amongst his teammates, smiling and genuinely looking as though he's enjoying himself playing the game was the highlight of my footy weekend. It really was. And Magic, if you're listening, and let's be honest, I'd be shocked if you were. Um, I know I'm not alone in looking forward to seeing you return to form as somebody who is continually providing those the actions of the one percenter that your club truly needs defending the 50, knocking the ball away from those forwards, playing great defense. It's nice to have you back out there, sir. It's nice to have you back out there. Now, the last thing related to the games that I wanted to get into, and this is one that people have been talking about since it happened, and it really has polarized some people, and that was the incident that took place between Marley Williams and Ed Richards. The elbow that Williams laid on Richard's head certainly looked vicious. And he and uh, Richards left the game with what was perceived to be a concussion. Okay, he did not return to the game. Now, I've seen multiple statements from people on social media saying that, that Williams should be banned two to four games. Now, I'm not an expert on this sort of thing, other than knowing that Tom Hawkins needs to keep his elbows to himself. Um one of the problems that I have with this warranting any more than say a week. And I, and I think sure elbow to the head that definitely warrants a suspension, but here's the thing that I have a problem with. Okay. I think the match review panel is probably going to give him a week for this. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this would be round one as opposed to the second exhibition game. But if you get a chance to see, the video and they showed most of it from a the angle behind Ed Richards. But if you see the angle coming from Richards' right side as Marley Williams is coming towards the camera, it sure looked to me as though Williams was attempting to toe poke the ball past Richards' right leg and get it away from him so he couldn't move the ball further into the goal square. Now, sure, his elbow was reckless, but the intent, I don't think, and I could be wrong, but from what I saw from that side angle, the intent was the toe poke. The result was the elbow, which is going to cost him a suspension at least. You know, I don't, like I said, I don't know if that was something that warrants multiple games because he didn't go in there, at least from what I saw in my opinion, he didn't go in there simply to clean Richard's clock. It looked to me like he was trying to dislodge the ball. Like I said, I could be wrong about that, however. Now, if you uh, listen to episode eight, I dug into the historic game of Austis, and I really enjoyed the feedback that I got from many of you. There were quite a few of you in Australia who said you were unfamiliar with the game, just like I was. And it was exciting, it was exciting to dig into that history and learn more about that great game. 
Now this week, I wanted to dig a little further in a different direction. And I wanted to take a look back at the time when the VFL was getting ready to spread its wings and ultimately grow into the AFL that we know and love today. And the time period that I'm talking about is the mid-1980s. And this was a time period that while the VFL was wanting to spread its wings, those wings almost got clipped. This story is something that most of you may be familiar with. But as a relatively new footy fan, it's something I wanted to know more about. So I decided I wanted to research this and dig into this. And I did a lot of reading. Um, and from what I've been able to gather, back in 1983, the VFL was on the cusp of some dire times. There were some bad things happening in the VFL. And in fact, by 1986, the VFL as we know it, it almost folded. According to a 2016 article from The Age written by Jason Dowling, he, he stated in, in this article that due to financial issues, that there were seven clubs, Fitzroy, Geelong, Footscray, Collingwood, Melbourne, North Melbourne, and Richmond, that were near financial collapse or bankruptcy. And in 1986, and I didn't realize that this when I dug into this a little bit more, that this gentleman is actually was an actual government employee. This was not a corporation. This was somebody that worked for the government. But in August of 1986, the Corporate Affairs Commissioner, a gentleman by the name of Gordon Lewis, and for those of you that are listening in the U.S., this is an official government position. This is not somebody that is in a corporation or a business. This is somebody, from what I could tell from my digging, it appears as though he's part of the, the national government in Australia and part of the government's treasury department. Well, this Commissioner Lewis, he wrote a letter to the seven clubs that I mentioned to you before, Fitzroy, Geelong, Footscray, Collingwood, Melbourne, North, and Richmond, and he told them that Fitzroy and North and St. Kilda, who I did not mention, and Melbourne were going to need to seek to either merge with one another or some other clubs. And to me, that means then that maybe Richmond and Collingwood and Geelong were maybe not in as dire straits as the other ones. Um, but he said, quote from the article, please advise me within seven days what steps the Victorian Football League or its club company members, club company members propose to take to remedy the situation. Unless your response to me contains some viable proposals to remedy the present situation, it's my intention to carry out my statutory obligations. Now, what are those obligations? Well, according to the article, those obligations were to shut down the league because it was not economically viable. He was talking about actually shutting down the VFL. Now, the VFL may have come back in some permutation, but without those clubs. And could you imagine the league without those clubs? I know I can't. I'd have to find another team to support. And from what I gathered during this this reading that I was doing on this, that there were only a handful of teams, Essendon, Carlton, St. Kilda to an extent, even though he mentioned them earlier and saying they had to merge, and Hawthorne, and by this time Sydney, because they had uh, moved from South Melbourne just, I think, the year before, 1982, I believe, was the last year in, in South Melbourne before they went to Sydney. But these are the only clubs that were fiscally solvent. And one could argue that uh, Sydney was in that position simply because they had moved to a new city. And they, they still kind of had that new car smell, if you will, being in a different city. Now, in 1986, former St. Kilda Saint by the name of Ross Oakley was appointed chairman and CEO of the VFL. He ultimately remained in that position of CEO after the permissions were, excuse me, after the positions were split in 1993. So he, he had this job for eight years. Okay. And Oakley said that the clubs had some balance sheets that were really pretty disastrous. 
and it came very close to despair disappearing as a competition that the league almost collapsed because of the finances wasn't because of the play on the field. It was because of the finances. And as he said, I think there would always, well, there always would have been some form of Australian football, but not in the form that it was in and not a VFL the way it was. And up until that point, the Victorian government, they didn't even want the game to expand to other states in Australia. So the team moving to Sydney did not, I'm sure, sit well with the Victorian government because the Victorian government was actually considering passing legislation to prevent teams from expanding or from keeping the VFL from expanding outside of Victoria. They wanted to keep it contained within just that state. Okay. And, you know, ultimately, though, we did end up having clubs going to Western and Southern Australia to Queensland and New South Wales. And who knows, maybe elsewhere sometime down the road. Now, one can certainly argue that the, the VFL purists may not have liked the ideas of expanding their game. But when you stop and think about it, expanding the game, bringing, bringing Brisbane and West Coast into what is going to become the AFL, for all intents and purposes, help to save the league because the money that they chipped in when they began their franchises helped to stabilize some of the other teams. So there were some serious problems going on in 1986 leading into 1987. And I'm going to jump around here a little bit because we're going to go back and forth between 1986 and 1983. So I want to jump back to 1983 right now. And the leadership in the VFL kind of saw the proverbial handwriting on the wall, if you will. They saw the financial problems that were beginning to surface in the league, and they wanted to figure out how to go about heading them off before they got worse. Well, we know that maybe they didn't do as good a job with that as they could have because of what we just talked about happening in 1986. Okay, Now, these cracks were beginning to show in the way that the VFL con had conducted the league. They realized that they needed to talk to some people that might have some suggestions on how to resolve their issues. Now, one of the things that they were concerned about was the salaries, how much players were getting paid. And from what I had been able to gather, salaries had grown to a point where it had become unsustainable, to a point where Many of the clubs were actually in the red, and I had done some reading, and I think it was actually in the, the article from The Age where they talked about where some of the clubs did not even have enough money to pay the taxes that they were having to pay on the salaries. But there wasn't enough money to do even that. So several leaders of the VFL made arrangements to travel here to the United States. And what they wanted to do, I guess, was meet with the leadership of the different sports organizations here in the United States. And one of the people that made that trip um, this direction was a gentleman by the name of Richard or Dick Seddon. And he was an attorney who had served as the club secretary for the Demons from 1980 to 1984. He went on this trip with the vice president of the VFL, a guy by the name of Ron Cook. And when they made this trip to the U.S., they met with the leadership, the heads of all four major sports, all four sports organizations, the NFL, the NHL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball. Now, prior to doing this, Seddon had come up with what I think is a rather unique way to try to generate money for the demons. But I'll tell you about it if you've not heard of this, and you tell me if it was a steady source of income. He actually set up an, basically an insurance program where if you're a Demons fan, you could purchase a life insurance policy. And it said that the life insurance policy cost $268. Now, I don't know if that was $268 a year or if it was a, a one-time purchase. It doesn't. The math doesn't seem right if it was a one-time cost. Because what would happen is after you, that Demons fan, died, 
that insurance policy would pay $100,000 to the club. Now, that's a rather unique way to try to generate money. So I think that $268 had to be per year. I don't think that could be just a one-time payment. But you talk about taking your club membership seriously. If you're buying an insurance policy to pay the club after you pass away. Wow. Now, once Mr. Cook and Mr. Seddon got to the United States, they met with, uh, and this is according to an article that came out in February of this year, just a couple of weeks ago from ESPN, written by Shannon Gill. Uh, the, the people that came along with this uh, contingency of the VFL, they didn't get very many recommendations from the NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle. Rozelle was kind of confused as to why these people were here. He was busy with his own league. He didn't really have a whole lot to tell them. Now, they met then with the heads of Major League Baseball, and the National Hockey League as well. Now, one of the uh, things that the MLB did talk about with this contingency was the idea of free agency. Okay, because only about a decade before this meeting, I'm enjoying some nice peppermint tea right now, but about a decade before this meeting was held, back in the late 60s, early 70s, if you were a major league player, you played under what was known as a reserve clause. And Major League Baseball was considered a trust, a monopoly, if you will. Okay, so if you're a member of a team, you got signed by a team, you were a member of that team either until you retired or left baseball or you were traded to another club. There was zero opportunity for a player to leave their present club and strike out to find a job with another organization or in fact refuse to play with a team who did not give you a contract or would not give you a contract, okay? Now, in 1969, this was challenged by a three-time All-Star, a seven-time Gold Glove winning center fielder by the name of Kurt Flood. And Kurt Flood played, Kurt Flood played for the St. Louis Cardinals, a great baseball team in the 1960s. And at the end of the 1969 season, he was traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, his contract with the Cardinals had expired, so technically, he did not have a contract. So, he argued that, that he should be allowed to go out and seek employment with what other team he w- whatever team he wished. Now, under the reserves clause, his new team was going to give him a contract, so he would be getting his new contract from the Phillies because he had been traded. He didn't want to play for the Phillies. Now, Kurt Flood was a man who had grown up and in many ways was still living under the remnants of Jim Crow laws here in the United States. He had been raised in Oakland, California. But once he had gotten into professional baseball, he and his wife were in, I believe, someplace in Texas and refused the ability to rent a house because of their skin color. Kurt Flood is African-American. And Mr. Flood had marched with, in 1962, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and he had marched with his idol, Jackie Robinson, the first African-American to play Major League Baseball. And they, he marched alongside them in the nonviolent protests that were organized by the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People here in the United States. What I'm saying to you is that Mr. Flood was not afraid to stand up for his rights. And the case of his new contract, he truly believed that he should be able to go out and sign a contract with a team of his choosing. Well, it turns out that did not end up being the case. Now, I'm going to get back to Mr. Flood's story in a moment, but I wanted to go ahead, uh, and it's a very important story because uh, of what's going to happen about 15 years later in the VFL. And that's going to be where Swans player by the name of Silvio Foscini, and I may be getting that name wrong. I've not heard it before. Silvio Foscini, he left the Swans and decided to go play with St. Kilda in the middle of the season without any kind of approval, any kind of clearance, anything like that. And this kind of flew in the face of the 
zoning laws, if you will, that the, the VFL has in place. They put those in place in 1967. And ultimately, you know, this was designed to keep people playing for the clubs that they were assigned to. Okay. Now, ultimately, the AFL would, would hold their first draft where they actually drafted players in 1986. And this happened with the addition of the West Coast Eagles and the Brisbane Bears. Now, getting back to, to Kurt Flood, he refused to play for the Phillies in 1970. So he sat out the entire season. He did not play baseball. He did not get paid. But he was standing up for the principle of him having the right to go out and seek employment elsewhere. Something that we now have happening in the AFL, where players, once they're out of contract, can choose to sign with another team. Okay? Now, he refused to play with the Phillies in 1970, and ultimately, he only played a handful of games in 1971, and his career was basically over at that point. Now, the wheels of, of justice, if you will, don't always move quickly. So you may have an injustice that is happening towards you, and you decide that I need to file a lawsuit or something of that nature, that doesn't happen instantaneously. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes time. So while all this is going on, Flood is, is filing lawsuits to try to get his independence, if you will. He grew up under what were called Jim Crow laws here in the United States. And I'm going to put a link to, you know, if you're in Australia, the Jim Crow laws are something that may be new to you. I'm putting a link in the show notes about the Jim Crow laws. You can read up on those. But it was these were things that were going on mainly in states in the southern part of the United States following the Civil War, where it was trying to marginalize the rights of African Americans and prevent them from being able to exercise their full abilities as American citizens. But Flood's case ultimately made it before the United States Supreme Court, and he lost his case by a five to three vote. Now there are nine judges, there are nine justices on our Supreme Court. One of them. Justice Lewis Powell stepped away. He recused himself from the case because he announced that he actually owned stock in a company called Anheuser-Busch, which is a, a brewing company. And, and Anheuser-Busch owns the St. Louis Cardinals. So he thought there was a conflict of interest. So he stepped away from this case. And at the last moment, the chief justice at this time he decided to flip his vote. I believe, or flip his vote, and I believe this was Warren Burger. I did not write his name down, but I believe this was Warren Burger, if I remember correctly. I teach government; I should know this. I think it was Warren Burger. He's he's who was replaced by uh, William Rehnquist later on. He changed his vote at the last moment, so he was going to vote in favor of Kurt Flood, but that would have left it at a four to four vote, which would not have been enough to grant free agency to Kurt Flood. But what he did was he started the process. He primed the pump, if you will. If you think about it as being a pump, a water pump out in an agricultural area where you're digging a well and you're having to pump the water out of the ground, he got the pump going, okay? Because what's going to happen here, and I should say the chief justice said, well, you know what? Major League Baseball is a monopoly, so I can't just give you free agency because of the reserve clause, because they are a trust they're a monopoly, if you will. You'll need to go ahead and resolve this through collective bargaining, through the players union, if you will. Okay. And that ultimately happened. And by the end of the season, 1975, so only four years after Flood's career ends, the first Major League Baseball player becomes a free agent. And that was a pitcher by the name of Andy Messersmith. I've got one of his baseball cards somewhere in a box upstairs. Uh, he left the Los Angeles Dodgers and signed a contract with the Atlanta Braves. Now, this foundation of free agency is something, like I said, that's going to ultimately be something that gets incorporated into the VFL and the AFL, allowing players after they've finished out their contract to go play for another club. Okay. Now, 
Getting back to Mr. Cook and Mr. Seddon on their trip here to the United States, they'd become rather frustrated. They'd visited with Major League Baseball. They had visited, you know, they, and they talked about free agency with them. They visited the NHL, did not learn a whole, whole lot. They had visited with the NFL, and Pete Rosell was kind of wondering, hey, who are these guys? Okay. But Seddon ended up having a conversation with a gentleman I had not heard of before I read this article. And turns out he's an American expat, and I guess he was a huge TV star in Australia, a gentleman by the name of Don Lane. Now, Don Lane was familiar with sports here in the United States, having been from here. And he was also one of... Melbourne's more famous supporters, if you will, at the time. And he made a suggestion to Mr. Seddon and Mr. Cook that they meet with the head of the National Basketball Association, the NBA, a guy by the name of Larry O'Brien. Okay, now at this time, the NBA was not what it is today. Okay, the NBA is a global entity. People are watching LeBron James play basketball in countries all over the world. I know that because I, when I'm watching footy, I will occasionally see commercials on television for the NBA. I know that, ha- I know that that's going on. Okay. But like I said, at this point in time, the NBA was not this juggernaut, this huge money-making machine that it is today. Many of the teams were struggling to survive economically very similar to the problems that the VFL was having. Okay. You had some teams that were doing very well financially, the Lakers in Los Angeles, the Boston Celtics, the New York Knicks, they were all very successful clubs, but there were others that struggled to get fans in the, in the door to to sell tickets. You had some that left the cities they were in for greener pastures I remember there used to be a team in Buffalo, and if I'm not with Buffalo, New York, which is about four hours east of where I am, and I believe they left and went to San Diego, California to play there, hoping to get larger crowds and therefore generating more money for the team. And I believe they actually became the Los Angeles Clippers, okay, because that team left San Diego and went to Los Angeles. Okay, but the commissioner was not too terribly enamored with talking to Cook and Seddon. Okay, so he introduced them to the NBA's legal counsel, a gentleman by the name of David Stern. You might have heard of him. Yep, that David Stern. David Stern is later on going to spend close to three decades As the commissioner of the NBA, he's going to replace Larry O'Brien in that position when he's done. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, David Stern did pass away back on New Year's Day about seven weeks ago. So Seddon and Cook sit down to talk to him about the problems that they're facing in the game. And Stern was very interested in the situation that was going on with Silvio Faschini. They spoke to him at length about that and how they were trying to deal with that situation. And according to Gill's article, this is when Stern began to talk to them about what he called the NBA's aggregate salary cap rules. And Sedden and Cook kind of looked at one another and they were, they were very interested in salary cap. Tell us more. So this idea of the salary cap on, on how much teams would be able to spend on salaries began very quickly to sound like a great solution to the problems that the VFL was having. If you remember earlier in the episode, we were talking about how many of these teams were struggling to make payroll. They could not pay the salaries of the players because in many cases, the salaries had increased and had outpaced the amount of money that the league was able to bring in, but they were still obligated to, play those, to pay those players. All right, so... The scheduled meeting time comes and goes. It's over. And Seddon wants more. He realizes, you know what? This is a guy who might have some input about stuff that we we can use. We can take back home and incorporate it in our game. And we can keep our game alive. So Seddon begged him, pleaded with him. Can I come back tomorrow to talk to you again? 
And Stern said, sure. And the next day, they spent the entire day basically going through the NBA salary cap rules almost word for word. So as, as Stern is sitting down and explaining these things to him, Seddon is furiously writing down notes on a notepad and kind of, if you will, translating the NBA salary cap into VFL. Okay. So he basically rewrites these rules and becomes up with these new salary cap rules that he thinks are going to help write the finish, you know, help keep the VFL afloat. And in fact, he has them done that night back in the hotel room. He's got them written. He's ready to go. Okay. And the VFL commissioner at that time, a gentleman by the name of Jack Hamilton was thrilled about this, this great idea that Seddon had discovered and he had adapted to fit their need. And the salary cap was actually put in place almost immediately. I mean, it was like they got back off the plane. I think they let him get their luggage. I think they let him get back you know, home, maybe put on some clean socks, take a shower, whatever the case may be. But they, they implemented it very quickly. Okay. And it allowed some of the con- some of the bigger contracts that were out there to be grandfathered in, meaning they still got to pay him. But it began to put it began to slow down the increase in the amount of money they're paying to more and more players. Okay. It helped to make the less affluent clubs stabilize their finances. It gave them the opportunity to compete on a more level playing field with the with the wealthier clubs. And like I said, by nineteen eighty six that first draft was held. Okay, you're bringing two new teams into the league. Their revenue that they're providing to uh, to play in the league helps to stabilize it even more. And what's interesting is that this new draft, this 1986 draft, it's nothing like what we see today. That's one of the things that I, I, I missed, and I could go back and watch it now if I chose to, but I missed this uh, because my Watch AFL app um, subscription had expired and the new one didn't kick in until the beginning of January. I missed the draft. And it's a two-day affair on television. The NFL has it as a three-day affair now. The NFL has three days, well, one e- one evening and then two days. They do the first round. There's seven total rounds. They do the first one, and then they do two and three on the second day, and then four through seven on the third day. But the AFL is, show- is televising the draft. A little different than the first draft back in November of 1986. Okay, and according to an article that I read from Emma Quayle on AustralianFootball.com, the first ever draft pick, a gentleman by the name of Martin Leslie, he didn't even know he had been picked. Brisbane picked him. He had no clue. He had just signed a new two-year contract extension to play with Port Adelaide in the Sandville. He had no idea he'd been drafted. He was back up uh, in he was up in Darwin. I don't know if he was from Darwin or not, but he was up in Darwin working an off-season job, and he happened to pick up a newspaper and saw his own name in the paper. They said, hey, you're the first pick of the draft. That's a little different than what we deal with now. Um, so we've come a long way in 34 years. So this was just a little tale about how an iconic – sports commissioner here in the United States, you know, we, we look very highly upon um, David Stern here, at least I do in terms of growing the game, how he in a small way helped VFL survive, which then helped the AFL thrive in just his little small way. I think that's pretty cool. Now, the only, the only question I still have here is if I could just get someone to explain to me how zoning works in terms of which clubs, which areas teams are able to tap into for players. So if you've got any idea how zoning works in the AFL and you want to come on the show, I would love to have you on and talk about it and interview you and figure out how this works. I've read up on it. To me, it's rather confusing. And this, you know, we could go through an episode or six. Um, on how this works because to me it looks rather complicated okay now i'm going to go ahead and wrap up here that we're pushing 45 minutes now and ladies and gentlemen i hope that you've enjoyed my rather shallow dive into how that future nba commissioner played a small part in keeping the the vfl viable um i hope you've enjoyed this 
it did, took a lot of reading, a lot of digging. Um, and I honestly, folks, I cannot tell you just how much I appreciate you tuning into my show. The fact that you're listening is extraordinarily humbling. And if you're enjoying my podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you'd consider sharing it with a friend. You can find links to the show in the show notes. So feel, feel free to copy one of them and share them. The Apple one would probably work the best or Spotify because uh, those are things that pe- more people tend to have. But there are all kinds of different ones that are there. And one last thing before I finish up tonight. I've had a poll up on Twitter and on my a Yank on the Footy page on Facebook asking people if they'd be interested in a, uh, a sticker from the podcast. Uh, you can see the logo if you, when you go to the to look at the episodes. You can see the logo with the little guy with the ball. and Well, first of all, that, that little guy does not look anything like me. Okay, Doesn't, I look more like the ball, quite frankly. Um, but I've had about 25 people respond between the two platforms, and about 70% of them said yes that they would be interested. Now, if you are in Australia or you're overseas somewhere else, it would probably end up costing about three to four dollars to send you one of these stickers. So if it's something that you would be interested in, you could send me a note on Twitter or on the podcast's Facebook page, a yank on the footy. If you search that out, you could leave me a note on there because I think the two polls are getting ready to close this evening. And let me know. Now, I've not set anything up um, like a PayPal or a Patreon or anything like that for collecting money for the sticker. This is that's not, you know, that's not that's not there at this point right now. You know, ultimately, you know, I'm looking at the possibility of trying to find some advertisers for my podcast. But uh, I'm having fun with it right now. And the advertising part is not necessarily first and foremost. Um I just know that if I'm going to be mailing out 25, 50, 100 stickers, that could get to be very expensive very quickly. So it's basically just helping to cover the cost of of the postage. So once I gauge how many people would be interested in this, I'll go ahead and set up some sort of a, uh, a conduit to allow that to happen where I would get everybody's address as well. And then I'll get those stickers printed up. I've, I've looked at uh, a couple different places to get them printed. And um, I mean, quite frankly, I kind of want to get one printed just to put it on my own car. You know, I have the bumper sticker for the college that my daughter goes to. I have two stickers on there that say that I'm a United States Navy veteran and that I am a United States Navy dad because my son is an officer in the, in the U S Navy. And then I've got two Geelong cats stickers on my back window as well. I would love to have a sticker of my very own podcast on there. I think that would be pretty cool, quite frankly. So ladies and gents, I am going to go ahead and wrap up here. Now I appreciate you listening and don't forget you can find all of the episodes of this podcast at a yank on the footy dot podbean dot com. And you can also find it on your favorite podcast provider. And now that you've listened, I hope you'll consider giving me a review. Let me know and how let you letting me know how I'm doing. Okay. Let me know let me know what I need to work on and what I'm doing well. Okay. And let's the podcast host know as well. And don't forget you can reach out to me at a yank on the footy at gmail.com. I check my email every day. I would love to hear from you. You can reach me on on Twitter at yank underscore on can send me a message there. I check my Twitter several times a day as well. And you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram at a yank on the footy. I want to thank Mr. Joseph McDade for the use of two of his great pieces of music. Mr. McDade creates some fantastic tunes and I'm using the pieces elevation and backplate. And you can find his music at Joseph McDade.com slash music. Again, Mr. McDade, thanks a lot for your hard work and your wonderful music. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you because while we're fans of our teams deep down, we're fans of a game that we all love, and that's the game of footy. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to consider sharing this podcast with your friends. I truly appreciate you listening, and may your dribble kick never hit the post. I'll catch you later.
This has been episode 10 of A Yank on the Footy. Don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on on Twitter or to yank on the footy at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at A Yank on the Footy. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening and please consider sharing this podcast with your friends and family.